Okay, so I'm back. Uh, Samantha did the three-part series. I hope you really enjoyed that. Uh, I've been able to get her to be open to coming back in to do some more videos, so stand by for those. Um, I do need to tell you, since we filmed that three-part series, that Samantha has hurt her back significantly. So if you're a praying person and come from faith, uh, I would really covet your prayers for her. Uh, and for me, if you're not a praying person, listen, send good vibes, think good thoughts, um, because she's got a lot of pain in her back, and so we're trying to get her back to normal. So today, I wanted to start a discussion on trust. Now, I will tell you when I let everybody know, or when the staff let everyone know that Samantha was coming in, I would say six or seven pages, single-spaced, worth of questions came in. And I would say that at least 60% of them had to do with trust. How do you trust again? Principles of trust. How did you start to trust him again? What were some of the things that you guys did? So today I'm going to open up a discussion on barriers to reestablishing trust. My hope today is that this is a conversation piece for you and your spouse. If your spouse is not in the equation anymore, if you're a betrayed spouse, I would love your feedback on things that were barriers to trust for you. If I don't touch on them, then tell me or tell our little community here what were some of the things that maybe I didn't talk about that were barriers to you being able to trust your mate again. Now, the simple truth is, man, relapse makes it incredibly tough for you as a betrayed spouse to trust your spouse. Um, acting out again, things like that. Those are the obvious things. But today I want to talk about a little bit of the minutia, some things that really will prevent the betrayed spouse from trusting again. And if you as an unfaithful spouse want to regain your spouse's trust, you're going to have to implement some of the things that I'm going to share with you. You're going to have to absolutely eradicate all of these things in your life if you want your spouse to one day trust you again. Now, the retort is, Samuel, am I going to have to do this forever? I don't know. It depends upon the severity of the situation. The comeback is, are we going to have to live like this? Am I going to be a doormat forever? Is this the, what life is going to be like? I can't tell you because I don't know your situation, but I will tell you from my story, 12 years later, these things have become a part of my life. It's just the way that I live, and they're not an encumbrance at all. I don't feel shame. I don't feel humiliation by some of the things that I do because it ministers security to Samantha. And though we are 12 years down the road, which seems like an eternity to many of you, to people that are 20 or 30 years down the road, it's not. It's simply 12 or 13 years. And these things are principles that keep our marriage secure and strong and helping Samantha feel secure. I had a spouse tell me just recently, she said, there's literally no area of our life that hasn't been affected by this infidelity. And it's so true. It is a nuclear meltdown that comes your way. And so if you want to get to the other side of it, if you want to reestablish trust, here are some barriers that are going to prevent you from regaining trust. Because trust, one of the ways that you regain it is having healthy communication. Because as you talk and communicate and connect, it's going to help you begin to build Honesty, because honesty is what rebuilds intimacy, and intimacy is what spills over into trust. So many people say, well, I can never trust him again, and if I can't trust him or if I can't trust her again, how could we ever move forward? Well, you don't need trust to move forward. You need honesty, because honesty is what's going to rebuild intimacy, and intimacy is what is going to rebuild trust days, months, years, decades down the road. Number one is unaccounted for time. This was pretty easy for me because I had lost all my friends, was in a new city, a new job, new lifestyle, everything. But I will tell you, even now, I don't have any unaccounted for time. Samantha knows where I'm at. Samantha has an idea. When I leave, I'm going here. I'm going to do this. I don't sit at the door. For those of you that are a bit cynical, I don't sit at the door and go, OK, I am going to drive right to the meeting. And then, I, no. I don't live that way. But it's a very simple reality for me to say, hey, 
I'm going to go meet so-and-so for a drink. Uh, I'll be back, I don't know, a couple hours. Samantha says, okay. It, in the heat of the moment, if Samantha had a horrible trigger, she'd pull up, find my iPhone, and know exactly where I was. If that wasn't working for some reason, she could go to find friends that we have. I use that for all of my kids because I want to know where all my kids are at any given moment. And you know what? It's very easy for Samantha to use that to know where I am at. We don't have those issues. It's 12 years down the road. And unfortunately, 12 years ago, we didn't have find my iPhone and five friends and all that. But I would take pictures of where I was if she needed to. If I went to have a drink, if we got in a fight, as you heard from her. I took a, a picture one time at a bar of me and my buddy. And I said, this is where we're at if you need me. And it was a hellacious fight. But the fact that I did that and that she had Brad's phone number and that she and Brad just texted once, she told me down the road, that was huge because I was so angry at you and I knew that you were so angry at me, but you cared enough to stay accountable. That was, in many ways, recovery changing, if you will. The simple truth is, if you're an unfaithful spouse, why do you have anything to hide? How and why does it irritate you that your spouse knows where you're at at any given moment? Why would that be an encumbrance when you're trying to regain trust? A second principle is if you want to rebuild trust, one of the barriers is laziness in your own recovery. I don't know why we expect our spouse to trust us again if we're hesitant to go see a therapist or hesitant or resistant to do an EMS weekend or read a book or do the boot camp on our website or, or just be together and talk and communicate and, and really show a passion for recovery. If we're lazy in our recovery, why would our spouse think that trust is coming back into the equation because it's not a dedicated approach to recovery. We're not putting everything into it. So if we're lazy about our recovery, we're going to be lazy about our accountability, and that's going to produce a real hesitancy on behalf of the betrayed spouse to trust you again. Another piece to the equation is not getting any help. So we as an unfaithful want to regain trust, but we're not getting any outside help. And this is where I have to be graciously, but yet cynically, forthright. Well, all therapists, they're just wanting your money. No, no, they're not. They're really not. Some of them, I'm sure, are, there's some bad ones out there. But no, not everyone is that way. Well, a fair recovery just wants to get our money. Well, no, that's not the case. Um, do the boot camp. It's free. You can do that. It's a seven-day program. It's very thorough. It'll probably take you 10 to 12 days. But if you're not willing to get outside help, why would your spouse ever trust you again? Because to think that you, as an unfaithful, can flip the switch and now you're not going to act out or you'll never do it again when you promise to never do it in the first place, it's very hard for them to trust that your own willpower is going to bring about abstaining from acting out or having another affair or for them to trust you again simply based upon your own power, I'm sorry, is ambitious, ambitious and unfortunately very naive. Another barrier to being trusted again is a lack of empathy. You see, when we, the unfaithful, don't have any empathy and we don't have much remorse, it communicates a message to the betrayed that we're not getting it and we're not safe and we don't feel remorse for what they've done. And so why would they then trust us again when we're not showing any true remorse or empathy? It communicates to the betrayed that we aren't really in uh, cahoots or we're not connecting with what we've done to them. We don't see the wreckage and the collateral damage that has been spilled out upon their life. And so why would they become vulnerable and trust themselves with us again when they're constantly afraid that we're going to do it all over again because we don't have any empathy, we don't have any remorse. And one of the things that I think Samantha started to feel safe with me was the instance of being able to communicate empathetically and, and to show genuine remorse. Not fake cry and not make myself cry, but actually put words to the grief, the guilt, the shame that I was feeling because then she was able to go, man, he's starting to get it, which made her begin to be more vulnerable with me. Another barrier to being trusted in is no accountability procedures. If your phone is on lockdown, but yet you're communicating that you are willing to do whatever it takes, I'm sorry you're not willing to do whatever it takes. 
you have to ask yourself, what are you hiding? Why can't your spouse pick up your phone and, and whittle through it? I, I mean, there's, I have a problem with that. Uh, if you don't have a uh, filter on your internet at home, but yet you've struggled with pornography for five, ten, whatever amount of, of years, but yet you're not willing to put a filter, there's something wrong there, okay? If you are refusing to get help from a therapist for whatever reason, there's something wrong there. If, if you won't go to an accountability group, if you won't be vulnerable with someone and ask them into your life and ask them to be an accountability partner and give them the right to ask you hard-hitting questions on any given time and any given moment, if you're not willing to do that, I'm sorry, there's something wrong there. Well, I don't have anybody. Well, uh, email in, okay? Post a comment. I'll make some suggestions for you. There's always a way to find some accountability if you're truly open to it and willing to embrace accountability in your life. Defensiveness is another barrier to trust. If you're defensive with your spouse when they ask you questions about where are you, what are you doing, who you're with, how was work, uh, Samantha used to ask me sometimes, I'll just be very vulnerable. I would work, uh, I'd go to a real estate office every day, uh, and there was constantly people coming in and out, and sometimes she would say, so, did anyone come in that you felt was attractive today? I felt like a felon. I felt like um, a complete failure. I felt, yes, like uh, just the worst member of society that I had to be asked, did I see any women that I felt were attractive? But you know what? For her, that was important. Most of the time, I'll be honest with you, I didn't. It, it just, call it God's grace, uh, a bit of humor, I, I, I don't know. It just, there wasn't a lot. Every now and then there was. And so a couple times I said, well, yeah, there was this one girl. She was kind of pretty, but, you know, I didn't talk to her. Or um, she just handed me some forms or what have you. And she, Samantha would say, well, you know, did you struggle? Was there any, you know, desire to pursue her or, you know, to connect? And I simply said, no. All I want to do is try and regain trust here and connect with you. I don't want to have anything to do with any other woman. And it was pretty much that simple. But if I ever got defensive, I promise you, there was an immediate withdrawal from me. It just communicated that I wasn't safe and couldn't be trusted because if you're getting defensive, you're actually kind of blaming your spouse for your actions as an unfaithful, and that doesn't communicate trust. That communicates suspicion. And if you ever want to see a betrayed spouse kind of lose their stuff, be suspicious because all kinds of triggers and red flags and alarms and sensors go off, and, and they are going to find themselves sniffing for anything that's going on, not because they're a, a train wreck of a person, but because you have created suspicion in their heart. And when that happens, I'm sorry, but as an unfaithful spouse, get ready. All the lights are going to be turned on you, and it's going to be a very difficult moment. In summation, I've, I've not had the time to be exhaustive, but these are some of the barriers. If there's barriers that you know of that I haven't talked about, please leave a comment. I want to hear about those. Um, I'm going to bring Samantha in soon to talk about trust again as well, but I hope these um, elements are helpful topics of conversation that you can talk about with your spouse to help cultivate communication that will spill over into intimacy, that will spill over into trust.